Uh, yeah, I, my parents are here because I am a uh, DC uh, born uh, boy um, back home from, from Brooklyn uh, for the first real stop on the Invention of Air global world, world tour. Um, so it's great, I, and it's great to start here in such a fantastic bookstore, Politics and Prose is. Um, I bought many books here and spent a lot of time here, so this is, this is really special. So you heard a little bit about what this is about. I, I'm, I'm going to talk. I'm not going to read. I'm going to do one brief, brief reading, um, which is a little trick I've learned about how to excel at book readings, which is to not read your own words, but to read Thomas Jefferson's words. That <laughs> always works really well. Um, and uh, you know, when you start, this is the first book that I've written about this period in American and British history and the founding fathers. And, and on the one hand, it's very promising because a lot of people are interested in this topic, as, as you know. Um, on the other hand, if it doesn't go well, you're on that track towards being a founding father impersonator, <laughs> which, um, so I may, by the end of the tour, be wearing a powdered wig or something like that. Um, I actually, I gave a talk at the Franklin Institute, where I'm going to be on Friday night in Philadelphia, um, but I gave a talk there uh, a few months ago, and as I was walking in the door, there was an actual Ben Franklin impersonator there. And Franklin is a huge figure in this in this book, and I'd spent a lot of time reading these letters between Franklin and and Priestley. And so as I walk in the door, and there's Ben Franklin there, and I so I introduced myself and said, "Hey, I just wrote a book about you." And he was totally in character and said, "Oh, really? Uh, that's very interesting." Priestley, yes. Well, Priestley and I met many years ago. It was 1765, I believe. And so uh, so that that I'm not going to actually do any more impressions, but that was that was that may be in my future. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I, I got to this story. Uh, as, as some of you know, I wrote a book two books ago about video games and pop culture and then went to the next logical thing, which was 19th century cholera. And, <laughs> and now I figured the only thing more exciting than 19th century cholera was 18th century chemistry. And so uh, here I am with this book. But I, I got to it through this kind of roundabout way, which was that I was going to write a a bigger book, which I think I'm still going to write, about innovation and the spread of ideas. Um, and one of the, th the things that I had been writing and thinking a lot about is ecosystems and how the metaphor of ecosystems is useful to think about the way that information flows through a society. And it was a, a theme that showed up a little bit in, in the Ghost Map, the last book. And so I was, I was kind of researching back into ecosystem science and reading a little bit about it for ideas. And I, I stumbled across the, this, this story about Joseph Priestley. And I had known a, a little bit about Priestley. Um, like, like most people, I think I had heard of him as the guy who had discovered oxygen for the first time. Um, and for those of you who know the, know the story, have had a chance to look at the book, um, well, that is his reputation. It's a little bit strange, because he did, didn't actually do it first. And he kind of got it wrong in some fundamental ways when he did do it. Uh, but for some reason, that's the line that has kind of stuck with him. And that's the first sentence of his Britannica entry and his Wikipedia entry, is that he's the guy who discovered oxygen. But I found out this other very interesting thing about him, which I think he deserves a lot more credit for. And, and part of this book is kind of evangelizing that, that this one discovery of his career, which is that he was the first person to realize that plants were creating oxygen. And uh, it's really quite an extraordinary story. And w what basically happened is if you go back kind of and look at the history of the science at that, that period, um, the whole question of investigating air as a, as a problem that science should wrestle with was something that took a long time for people to even realize. I mean, if you think about it, um, you look around yourself and you see lots of things that are probably worthy of studying. There's people and their bodies, and there's matter, and there's trees out there, and there are clouds in the sky, and all that kind of stuff. But the invisible space between us all didn't occur to anybody to be all that interesting for a long period of time. And it wasn't really until the 1600s when people first proved that there was this thing called kind of anti-air. There were vacuums where all the air had been pulled out of a space, and it behaved very distinctly differently from traditional air. Um, candles wouldn't light in it, for instance. Um, bells wouldn't ring in it. Um, and so people started to think, well, wow, there, there must be this invisible substance, substance that's kind of floating around us that we can't see, but that somehow is probably worthy of study. And through the 1700s, people started to think that maybe it was composed of different, different gases. It wasn't just one single unified thing. And that was about where the study of pneumatic chemistry was um, when Priestley got interested in it. Now, Priestley was very 
you know, classic Enlightenment era figure. He had no real training in anything. Um, he had come out of a kind of dissenting religious background, had written an early influential book on linguistics, um, kind of radical linguistics. In fact, he, he charted this path of radical politics and radical linguistics that basically Noam Chomsky would, would uh, end up doing uh, 200 years later. No one else has quite done that combination <laughs> since or, or before. Um, and he started dabbling in a, various, in, in a whole number of fields. He got interested in electricity. Um, he met Ben Franklin in 1765, crucially at a, at a coffee house in London, um, where Franklin used to hang out. And uh, Priestley persuaded Franklin to let him write a book about electricity. Priestley had this idea that there were all these amazing discoveries that were happening in the, in the, in, in the field of electricity, many of which Franklin had pioneered. And it would be important for somebody to come along and write a real kind of popular account of it, write it in English first, which was an innovation. A lot of scholarship at the time was written in Latin. And to really tell the story of how this science had developed and, and, and flourished over the last 50 years, and how it had all these interesting <laughs> practical applications, and how people at home in their home labs could build, take a little electrical machine and do these interesting experiments. And so he wrote this book on the history of electricity, which really, in, in many ways, invented the whole genre of popular science writing, um, which is kind of how I make my living now. So I, I'm indebted to Priestley in, in that sense. And it was very important because it, it was important, one, in the sense that it, it, it was about spreading the ideas um, and getting ordinary people involved in scientific research and teaching them the magic of, of all the stuff that had happened. Um, but it was important also in that it created this uh, really extraordinary friendship between Franklin and Priestley um, that, that lasted many years and shaped both their lives in, in crucial ways. And one of the interesting little footnotes to this is that that book on electricity is the first place that anyone had publicly written about Franklin's famous experiment with the kite. Um, so that classic you know, school kid image we all have of Ben Franklin, the great pioneering kite flying, uh, slightly insane guy with the lightning storm. Uh, comes from Joseph Priestley, actually. Priestley was one who was like, that's a great story. I'm going to write a book that talks about that. Um, so Priestley and Franklin had developed this friendship. And Priestley then got interested in this question of, of air and of gases. And in part, one of the reasons why he got interested in it was that he, he act, kind of accidentally moved in next door to a brewery. Um, he, was, he was, we'll talk a little bit about his religious side, but he was, he was a minister as well as a pioneering chemist and linguist and political radical, as people were back in the day. And uh, someone said reading about this book that they read the whole thing and they thought, what have I done with my life? This guy <laughs> is so accomplished. So, so he was, he'd gotten a new gig as, as a minister in, in, a, in a church in Leeds, and the minister's house wasn't quite ready. And so they moved in temporarily to this house that, that was adjacent to a brewery. And ever inquisitive, Priestley kind of walked over and, and started investigating. And I noticed that they had these giant vats of beer that was brewing, that were brewing. And, and he saw this kind of gas, kind of haze coming off the, the liquid. And he thought, well, this is going to be a great place to do experiments. And so he asked the proprietors if it would be all right if he could do a little work over their beer. And uh, I love that image of just this kind of eccentric minister from next door comes over to the brewery and can, can I open up a little lab here uh, <laughs> over your beer? And so one of the things that he does is he starts, one of the early experiments he does is he starts pouring water back and forth over this uh, brewing beer and he accidentally invents soda water. He, 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 he passes it back and forth and he realizes that it creates this nice little carbonated fizzy flavor. Um, and instantly, you know, sends off letters to everyone about it, says, oh, I've invented this wonderful beverage, and it's just delightful, and, you know, if you put a little juice in it, it's really tasty, a little wine. He almost invented the wine cooler. Uh, <laughs> and, and he thought for a while that actually it was, it was, going, to, uh, it was going to fight scurvy but, uh, successfully, but it didn't, in fact, have anything to do with scurvy. Um, so that was a little bit of a false lead. But it was typical of Priestley, and it was typical of Franklin, too, to share his ideas and his innovations with anyone who was interested in listening to them. He had, almost to a fault, n no interest in making any money or keeping anything proprietary in anything he did, um, which put him in a situation where he was constantly trying to find support for his work. Um, a few years later, actually, uh, a certain Johann Schweppes patented as, uh, a tonic water and did a little bit better with it. Um, since we're still paying royalties on it uh, to this day, anytime you have a gin and tonic most of the time. So, so Priestley was, was very much about the kind of the open flow of ideas um, 
and and he and Franklin really really shared that value. 